Come on, Soda Pop, let's go. Thank you, uh, Scott Erisman, Sioux Falls. I wanted to quote uh, my favorite founding father, Benjamin Franklin, because Robert Colby seems to like to do that. He said, uh, beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. Um, anyway, moving on from there, uh, uh, I think we really need to fix SIRE. And I hope it's done before we get into the budget hearings so that I, we can watch them. They're very long. I think anybody has to sit here in the audience and watch them, comforts of their home. So I hope we get that fixed. Um, even if it's considered an informational thing and not uh, um, public record, uh, uh, we are paying for it. So we should have that service to us. I watched an interesting um, exchange today about the 85, 85th Street Exchange uh, with I-29. Um, I think it's kind of disheartening that the city doesn't want to annex this land and get, a, get in with this thing right away. You gotta realize something to the, to the layman here. If we're not a part, if the city of Sioux Falls is not a part of this development, that means they're not a part of any municipality. That means there's two pennies that won't be taxed out there. It'll only be four pennies. Now you gotta kind of imagine this. If a big box store is out there and they're selling a television for $3,000, and a, and a big box store in Sioux Falls is selling a uh, television for $3,000, they will be able to get the television for $60 less if they go out to the 85th exchange. I don't understand why we would be passing up millions of dollars in sales tax revenue. Um, <clears throat> another thing that amazes me about that is just last year, this city went to the state legislature and begged for a third penny. But we're not using our brain here and going, the 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 immense sales tax revenue that we could get. And what is stopping T or Harrisburg to moving in and annexing this? I don't know. Um, I think um, we really need to consider and, and work with the group. Um, the other thing that could, I do have a concern about it though. Dakota Dunes was an example of another CID that was used. Dakota Dunes was one of these things that was set up so a lot of rich people could build their houses on a river, a river that floods every year, and so they could hide from paying a lot of taxes. But boy, when their houses all flooded, they sure wanted the government's help. And we all came down there at the National Guard and we helped them all out. So that does concern me a little bit that we would leave this as a CID and leave this just sitting out in the open. What I think this really is, and I've been hearing about this exchange for months, didn't know a lot about it, I think this is a, a battle between a bunch of developers and a bunch of people that are very well connected in this community. And that's all it really is, is a fight. Now, all I'm asking is that the city comes forward and gives their best effort and helps them and gets involved and tries to annex <coughs> this as soon as possible. The other thing I found amazing about their presentation <laughs> was that uh, they actually went to D.C. and they got things done with the federal government. We always sit here and talk about how we can't get things done with the federal government. Well, that's not true. You can get things done with the federal government. That's a great example there. I want to talk about Minnehaha County funding. They just had an opt out. My property taxes get to go up again. Um, because there's a discrepancy in the way we fund our governments. In the long term, I think that all property tax revenue should be transferred to the county and to the school district only. The city shouldn't get property taxes anymore. And we should move it in a way that it's adjusted. In the short term, uh, Sheriff Milstead actually talked about this in the Minnehaha County meeting when they, when they did the opt out. He's concerned a little bit about the Sioux Falls Police Department and arresting a lot more people than they really need to. And what he was getting at is anytime somebody is arrested, they have to be prosecuted. Well, the city doesn't pay for that. Now we pay for the police department to arrest these people, but then once they drop them off at the jail, it's the county's responsibility. I think there needs to be some more training and work done with the Sioux Falls Police Department to work on, you know, should we be arresting everybody or should we be working on these things in the field to save the county some money? And of course, it's gonna take state legislation there's been a lot of talk about, uh, you know, reducing violations and giving ticketing people instead of arresting them for things that they do. Um, and then also, I've been hearing stories. I'll leave it on this. 
Veterans Park, which is a beautiful park. Um, but I've been hearing stories of a lot of vandalism going on there. And I know we've been talking a lot about Heritage Park, but I gotta tell you some of the stories I've been hearing about Veterans Park make Heritage Park look like Disneyland. Uh, vandalism in the bathrooms, fires being set, uh, branches being broken. Um, I hope that we get a handle on this. It's a beautiful park and uh, I hope we do something about it. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Welcome. Bruce Danielson, Sioux Falls. <clears throat> I have a couple little uh, sheets here to put up there. And as somebody who's uh, interested in the construction activities of the city of Sioux Falls, I've been waiting for the webcam to work out at the uh, Spellerberg Pool, now known as the Midco Aquatic Center. And this is all we've been getting. And I don't know why, this is just kind of like Sire. I know many of you are having the same problem with Sire, we just can't seem to get anything to work. And so this just adds to another one of those frustrations. We were able to make a webcam work out at the event center when it was being built and we were able to follow the progress when it was running. And it was running most of the time, but practically every time I wanted to see it. So this was the first one that I've got. And then I wanted to go into another area because uh, uh, a year ago, on July 1st, I stopped up here and I had Scott who was going to help me with a PowerPoint and I had forgotten my PowerPoint at home. And I was going to be talking about the event center siding. And uh, so through a course of events, this administration had me arrested soon afterwards. And the night that I was going to be here putting the... Uh, talking about the, my PowerPoint, uh, I actually spent six and a half hours in the county jail, as <coughs> Scott was just referring to. So uh, I'm here to give my event center discussion on, on how event center siting is supposed to work. What you're seeing right here is we've just done a video this past week showing how much of a mess the event center siting is. We have uh, a lot of things that have been done at the event center that we ended up making this video that's, that's uh, seven minutes and 33 seconds long, and it's put to the music of the Four Seasons, because it's been four seasons since we were last up here trying to get something accomplished. And what we've discovered as we've been walking around there is we have little, <coughs> cute little covers covering the holes that we discovered. And so we have these holes as it's kind of hard to see in here, but if you take the cover away, and this is the picture that I put up over a year ago, showing the big hole that I can actually put two fingers into. They took care of that by making these cute little covers, and then they didn't even find a way to glue them into place, any way to stop the water. And so now, when the wind blows, these covers fall out. And if you watch the video, you see I'm pushing the cover back in with my finger. And where you can't see it at direct line, I actually put my uh, camera up and I was able to take a picture up higher than people can normally see and they didn't put any covers in there. So all that water is just pouring thousands of gallons down and these big rainstorms are getting poured down in that building and saturating the inside of the walls. That's a galvanized steel building and it's just gonna be rusting and the dirt is gonna be washing out. And when you watch the video, you'll see the building is getting stained with both rust and dirt because you cannot stop the dirt from trying to find its way back out of that building. So if you, so what we're doing here is you can actually see the dirt and the rust that's starting to develop and you'll see it a lot better on the video. But, and it's up on YouTube so everybody can go see it, but you'll see all over on this building are these effects. And go ahead and... So then we get into the problem that we have that uh, some city officials seem to think is a joke or it's a design feature or they're trying to pass off what they call oil canning. And what that is, is where you're taking a piece of steel. Now, I've been involved in the steel forming world for over 50 years. I grew up in it. And I, 
1965 was the first time I personally ran a shear and press break. So I kind of know what's going on. And I used to sell roll forming equipment. We used to roll thousands of feet of material. So kind of have an idea how to do it. And what we have here are channels. And they are essentially a channel like this. And what that channel is doing is forming a solid piece because of the way it's formed. And every little bend in this thing adds to the strength. But what the oil canning is, is because you can't bend this board. And that's what's happening there, is you can't bend that steel without causing it to crease. And we're re relying on these little tiny screws to hold that steel on the building into very light gauge steel studs. So when that's being bent around the building, it's doing this. And there's no way that building is going to last the 20 years that, this, that the siding manufacturer wants to warranty the finish. Because when you look close at the finish, Jim, you'll actually see where they've made mistakes. And instead of cutting a new piece, they slapped a whole bunch of caulk on it. You can even see where they've chipped it. And that's what that little spot is right below the caulk. And that's what's going to start the staining and the rusting, because you've broken through that protective surface. Go ahead. Thank you. And then you can see here they've, they've tried to just cock up something where they've made another mistake. And now we have another gash, multiple gashes. We have on a horizontal, if you've got a funnel effect, any water coming sheeting down that building is going to go dumped right into that building. And that's what we're running into. And then here's, well, we can, yeah, go to the next one. That's hard to see. So then we talked about the Tyvek. And the, supposedly, this is our water shield. And Tyvek, as you can see, this, I've been going out to the event center all along. There's, you can see the Tyvek. You can see the holes in it. You can see the tears. They didn't tape the seams. They didn't do it correctly. And I've put up a lot of Tyvek in my time. And I've never seen such horrible work as what they did here. There's no way that building is going to stop moisture from going in and, and causing mold in the walls. And we're going to be continuing with the problem. And I thank you for the time. I'm glad I finally got to give my little speech from a year ago. Uh, sorry for the delay. And thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wanted to engage the council? Welcome. <laughs> And council, that was uh, seven minutes versus five. I hope you understand. Welcome. Well, first of all, I ask that you clear your minds. <laughs> We're going to talk about flowers. My name is Teresa Staley from Sioux Falls. Um, and uh, the first uh, two things I want to talk to you about, I want to invite you all to the Master Garden Tour tomorrow night uh, from 4 to 8. Uh, there'll be four gardens that will be featured. Uh, some of them are in the country, some are in town here. And if you're interested, you can purchase tickets at Lewis Drug uh, in tonight and, and into tomorrow and come on over and see what different gardeners are doing in our area. Um, my garden will be on the Master Gardener Tour. This will be the third year I've been on the tour. And uh, this ties in with an issue that came up today at the 4 o'clock and that has to do with the plantings that I have on the boulevard. Um, and in the past, when these people have come through, last time I think we had 500 people come through on the tour, they're very interested in what's happening with these flowers on the boulevard. And, and they're, they like them. The history of, of my yard it happened 17 years ago. Um, I, and I've been inspired by the McKinnon Park area. You know, the parkway there where they have Russian sage, day lilies, Asiatic lilies, hostas. It's just beautiful. And those things get rather tall, very well maintained, but very beautiful. Um, when I started to develop that area, I met with Dave Munson, our mayor, several city council members, and Steve Metley, who was then our city planner. And showed they came by my house, they saw what I was doing, and they gave me their blessing. They said, go ahead. And I've been developing that area ever since. Um, right now, I have about 75% of that boulevard area in flowers. And I know this discussion came up last year, and I, I, it's coming up again. 
Um, and I just wanted to say, as we're discussing that, uh, gardeners I'm talking with, and we're going to be going out and meeting with other people who have all sorts of things happening in their boulevards. Um, because we think this is important for our city. <laughs> but I have planted things, and other gardeners have as well, that are drought tolerant, use less water. Our Kentucky bluegrass is a big water hog, and it's not environmentally friendly. Um, I have planted perennials in that area that perform beautifully, despite the sand and chemicals that the city dumps on it. I, I don't do anything to them. They just come back every year, uh, which is much different than a lot of people's grasses. And our, our current ordinance, some people may not know this, but if you have grass that has been killed by these chemicals, you are breaking the ordinance. You have to have some living ground cover there. Um, I've also been uh, planting native perennials that attract bees and uh, butterflies. So I'm always working to help the environment. I'm organic, I don't use chemicals, I've been building my soil, I'm trying to keep the rain from going into the storm sewer system. Um, so I think it's all a very positive thing. And what else is very positive is the response and support and encouragement I have had from so many of you last year when this came up and also this year. So God bless you for, for listening and, and being open-minded. And I'm just hoping that as we move forward here that we're going to be encouraging people to be creative um, and to continue to beautify our boulevards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. Folks, anybody else want to engage the council? Well, very good. Thank you, Ms. Colby. <coughs> Robert Colby, I wish to talk to you a little bit about tonight about future history. When digitizing came on, everybody thought we had gone to heaven because everything could now be taken and we could condense it. It would take up a very small amount of space. It was quick and easy to disseminate the information and you could search a lot of things quickly with things like well, Google and Bing, etc. And you could find information that wasn't available to you without years of research prior to that. It's also been thought that certain uh, governmental records ought to be digitized and then we can store that little digital CD or whatever and we don't have to have hard copy. Two things are coming that I've been made aware of and that you might take to heart. Number one, the Library of Congress has been doing research on CDs and all the other means by which we store the digital information onto a hard copy, a soft copy, whatever you wish to call it, they have been dealing with aging of these particular uh, items, the CDs and DVDs, etc. Now, how do you age something? Heat, cold, moisture, lack of moisture, uh, and all that sort of thing. And they've found that they have taken CDs from a single batch production brothers or sisters they've taken them put information on them aged them <coughs> and they found that one will retain the information and another will lose it and they were from the same batch of material another thing that came by more recently that a friend of mine who's very involved in photography that photographers are getting very concerned about is what they call bit rot. We have no way of knowing because we have not had this particular type of information or this type of technology around for 10 years in order to find out whether or not this particular material will maintain itself. Photographers have, are going to the point where when they make their images they are taking them and making hard copies because bit rot means that bits of information that are stored are degrading and that will cause the loss of your original that you are producing. Now, if it works on photography, which is a high uh, piece of, a large piece of information is stored when you do a, photo a photograph, 
It's simply giving you indication that what will happen with information that isn't quite as dense. So if you are making any kind of information available to the public digitally, I would recommend, and I think others would recommend, you make at least five different hard copies so that someone can read it in the future for several reasons. Number one, you can always go back to the hard copy. If you can read, you can read that, where the digital may degrade. And we know we can store hard copy for 100 years. We don't know whether or not, if I take this camera and I go and I make a photograph of the individuals here, how long will this last? It's a neat thing because I can do it quickly and easily, but it is not a long-term storage process. Make hard copies, put them in several locations, because we are relying on keeping this information and it will be something for the future generations. You don't need to make a thousand copies, but make a goodly number of hard copies to store so that when the archive can be utilized in the future. Because the formatting here is one thing, and the reading of the information off this piece of technology will change in five years or 10 years I can still see a hundred years from now and I can read it, but I may not be able to ever pull the information off of this piece of technology. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Colby. Come on, Soda Pop, let's go. Come on, let's go. Come on. <laughs>